Well, I don't know where the other guys are, but... <laughs> Maybe I should just play for you. Anything you want to hear? Steve Smith here. I'm currently on tour in Europe with my new trio, the Groove Blue Organ Trio that features Tony Monaco on the Hammond B3 and Vinnie Valentino on the guitar. We're playing in Sarlouis, Germany tonight. We just spent a, a week in Switzerland. We're gonna spend about a week here in Germany and then on to London to play Ronnie Scott's, one of my favorite clubs in the whole world to play. So we're having a great time. We're learning a lot of new music. We're out here playing and rehearsing every afternoon and working on new tunes because we're in the process of recording a brand new album. So drumming for me is control and power. And for me, there's an ambiguity of mathematics versus flow. You have both sides, like very complex drumming and very primitive, just this. So this is what I love about thinking about it, maybe more than I should. But what is your philosophy of drumming or what you love the most about this instrument? It could be also very primitive. Well, you said control and power. Now this sounds like a dictator to me. <laughs> Power is for dictators. And that is a beautiful line that Freddie Gruber once said to me when I told him I was interested in playing with power. And he said, power is for dictators. What you want is a big sound. And I wanted a big sound, but I learned how to get a big sound without using muscle, without using force. And uh, anyway, whatever it is that, that you're, you're thinking control and power, I'm not thinking of anything remotely like that when it comes to drumming. You know, I'm thinking about time, I'm thinking about swing, about feel, about communicating with the other musicians. And um, I don't think of anything about it in terms of black and white like one side or the other. It's everything. That's good because I don't want to hear what I just said. I want to hear a different opinion, yeah. to grow, to yeah. have another perspective. This is actually the reason why I do this whole show, to learn these kind of things, because Rudy means, yeah, you can do it at home. But yeah. get I'm talking about music. And, we, and the instrument is the drums, but it's the same concept whether you play the drums or whether you play the violin. You want a tone, you want a beautiful sound out of your instrument, and you want to be able to c communicate with the other musicians. There's so much to it. Learning about the fundamentals of music so you have a common meeting ground. You know, whether, whether you play Indian music or jazz music or classical music or rock and roll, there has to be some background, some foundation, so there's a common language and a common meeting place. What interests me, I can say one thing, is, is a wide variety of music. Um, basically, because I'm from the USA, I'm comfortable with the music of the USA. But the music of the USA is, is wide. You know, it all comes out of the blues. It all comes out of the swing rhythm. And, it, and then it grew from there. It comes from the blues to rhythm and blues and country western, and gospel and jazz, early rock and roll, you know, later rock and roll, then hip hop fusion, all, all of those kind of musics that developed initially in the USA and then 
moved to the rest of the world. So let's go right here to the drum set. Okay. Um, forget about drum love, enough of that. So drums <laughs> are kind of a patchwork instrument. Pa Patch, patchwork, work. like pieces of a puzzle and you define yeah. the puzzle. Sure. So in that sense, you can see the drum kit as separate voices. And during the sound check, you were talking about, this is not kick drum, tom one, two, three, but it's one instrument. Yes. But you have to make it one instrument. I mean, of course, you can buy a whole set, yeah. uh, but then the symbols, you pick those colors. So the question is, what agenda do you have for these choices, depending on, on, on the gig you have to play? Well, the, the initial drum set, as it developed in the, in the US, essentially was a bass drum, snare drum, rack tom, floor tom, hi-hat, and a cymbal or two. And that's exactly the, the kit that I grew up playing. So I'm very comfortable playing on that basic kit. Most of the vocabulary that developed in the jazz world, which is the initial drum set vocabulary, is something that I grew up playing and I'm, and I'm comfortable with. Then I can either make the drum set bigger or smaller depending on the environment and I'll change sizes. Like when I tour with Journey, I use 22 inch bass drums. When I tour with Vital Information or the Groove Blue Organ Trio, now I'm using a 20 inch bass drum. Uh, occasionally, I used to play with an 18 with, with Groove Blue, but it turned out to be not quite enough because Tony plays with such a big sound that I needed to go to a 20 inch bass drum to support that low end of the Hammond organ. So, you know, I'll change, change the, the setup depending on the music. But essentially, it, it's all about that fundamental kit, bass drum, snare drum, one rack tom, one floor tom, hi-hat, and cymbals. Like a, most of what I do is based on that. And then there may be more toms or more snare drums, but that's all for additional colors. This is what I'm, I was pointing at is, I mean, you can choose your favorite sounds, but then you have the other guys in the room or on stage. Yeah. And suddenly maybe you can't play the tom right now because the bass is having that sound. It's sound waves. You have to know about this. So this is what I was pointing at. Right. Like just staying, making sure that I'm staying out of the way of the other musicians, play, filling when it's proper to fill and then not filling and, and staying, staying you know, in the background. And that's the communication, the communication that happens, especially with jazz music, because it's so spontaneous. And every night we're creating something new and we, we allow the space for something new to happen. But it requires a lot of listening. And experience to know. Yeah, then what the experience listen. comes in of um, how comfortable you are on stage and exactly when you choose your moment and when you choose your moment to support or, or to jump out a little. And it's, it's always a little back and forth. When you hear us tonight, you get a really, you'll get a good idea of, of the kind of dialogue that goes on with this trio. mentioned jazz fusion when uh, the whole vocabulary of jazz fusion was developed in the yeah. late 60s early 70s yeah and Mahavishnu and all the other stuff you you were witnessing it yourself you were part right. of that yeah so um, how 
did that time, the generations before you, fuel your gear? What was the main yeah. thing that you took out from the past to want to get it to another level? It's, it's interesting to look back on the years of early fusion, like you just mentioned, the late 60s into the early 70s. And now we look back and, and we call that fusion. But at the time that it was happening, and it was like you said, it was happening when I was in high school and just out of high school in the early years of going to the Berklee College of Music, we, meaning myself and my peers, we saw it as jazz. It was just the, the forefront, the vanguard, the cutting edge of jazz. And, and if we called it anything at all, it would be jazz rock possibly, but it wasn't fusion. That word wasn't, nobody thought of that word at that time because the musicians that were making that music were jazz musicians. They were all the musicians, like you said, from the previous generation that at most of them had played with Miles Davis, Tony Williams, and Jack DeJohnette, and Dave Holland, and Chick Corea, John McLaughlin. Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, Joe Zawina, like all of the, that cast of players were pushing the boundaries of jazz. But they also, they came from a time where they were young enough to appreciate and embrace rock. They could, they could enjoy the Beatles, they enjoyed the Stones and then Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix. And so it naturally influenced the way that they played jazz. So that influence came out in the music. And that's what you hear with Mahavishnu Orchestra and re early Return to Forever, part one with Ayerto, and then you know part two with Lenny White. Also, it's another interesting thing to add is, because I, I mentioned before, like a lot of this music started in the USA by US musicians, early jazz, early rock and roll, country, all of that. But this early years of jazz rock, fusion, world players from around the world are having an impact on the music, really in a way for the first time. Like Joe Zawino from Austria, Jan Hammer from now Czech Republic, John McLaughlin from England, Billy Cobham from Panama, Ayerto from Brazil. So these, you know, so now jazz had been around long enough to influence musicians in other parts of the world. And then they are bringing these ideas to the U.S. And, and that's also becoming part of that mix, that early mix of jazz rock uh, developing into fusion. And then Jean-Luc Ponty, who I got to play with, you know, coming from France and and uh, coming, being in the Mahavishnu Orchestra and playing with Frank Zappa and then starting his own band. And then it goes on and on. There's, there's lots, lots of musicians uh, from all around the world make, making, having an influence on that music. like Journey has not so much the requirement of shining with your personal style like the jazz fusion has. Maybe do less than more to give it uh, the right support. But you can incorporate something clever. It's, right. And I would say you have to understand the nature and the possibilities of an idea and what you can do with one idea. What are your philosophies on different ways for just the same thing? You know what I mean? Or is it too... Uh, I think I, I think I understand what you're asking me. It's basically how, how to be a creative musician and play in this kind of rock pop format, and if I'm understanding your question, and and feel like the contribution has something creative to to offer, and. Um, 
but still takes care of the fundamental job of being a, a rock pop drummer and, and, a, and addressing music that's created for the masses, so to speak. You know, we're, we're jazz music, we'd love it to be <laughs> created for the masses, but you know, there's not that many people that are listening to it. There is a select audience and, and a sophisticated audience, but uh, for jazz, but it, it is it is less. Um, but when, for instance, during the writing process of creating Journey albums, because that's the way we wrote uh, we wrote our music. It was always thinking about the entire album, not thinking about singles. We were thinking, okay, you know, it's it's we just finished the tour in 1978, and now we have to go and do a record in 1979, and. We have to make a new 10 or get or 12 new songs, so we just start writing. And, and the way we wrote, the whole band got in a rehearsal studio and we just would jam. Here's a guitar riff, here's a keyboard part, here's a drum beat, here's a bass line, here's a melody. You know, everyone would come up with an idea and then the, the songs would develop and, and we would work on them collectively as a group and everyone was trying to be creative and clever and sophisticated but we were also imagining that we were playing in a stadium so there's a way of thinking that the music has to sound big and the and it can't be too there can't be it can't be too complex because you know if I'm playing for 40,000 people I'm not probably not going to have like perfect sound if I play a, a super fast fill or something, something that requires a lot of detail. So there's a lot of openness. So we worked with with the drum parts, for instance, to be very open and very big. So they would sound big in a in a uh, in a stadium, and the guitar parts had to sound big in a stadium. So that was part of our conception as we were writing. I took it very seriously and I recorded every single rehearsal and then I'd go home and analyze it and work on my parts. And then, of course, there was a lot of rehearsal time before we went into the studio. But when we went into the studio, we really knew what we wanted to do because we had spent so much time rehearsing because we didn't want to waste a lot of time in the studio. So those records were recorded, and especially by you know, the standards that developed later, very quickly. It'd be a couple of weeks and, you know, all the tracks would be done. Then they'd do some overdubs and then they'd mix it. And six weeks later or something. The, You're in the stadium. It's done. Yeah. And then we're back on tour and, you know, playing arenas and stadiums. So when I had to relearn that music to start playing with them again after a 32 year break from 85 to the last time I toured with the band was probably like 1983. And then I started touring with them again in 2016. I had no memory at all of any of the songs, really. I, I've heard some of them on the radio, but as far as playing the drum parts, I had to relearn them from scratch. And uh, so I transcribed every note, basically. Like, I just really got serious about learning exactly what I played because it, it made sense of why I played what I played in the moment because it all was part of this puzzle. You know, the bass part went with this and the guitar part went with this part of the drums and the keyboard part and it all worked together. So I relearned the parts and and I felt like the parts were pretty pretty good and I've updated them to a degree so they feel fresh to me now. But essentially I play exactly what I played on the records, the original records. And yeah, there was some pretty interesting drum parts in there. So I feel like it's stood the test of time. Talking to talking to talking to talk, God damn me, talking to talk, God damn me.
You know, generally conical is like a cappella. It's not, you don't usually play it and say it at the same time. Uh, so I started practicing the conical to learn the rhythms, and then I started to play the rhythms on the drum set. So then I thought, well, let me try to play and recite at the same time. So that's basically unison, you know, the voice and the, and you'll hear me do that tonight. I'll play da di takajuna da da di kiditum di takajuna da da di kiditum takajuna da di ta di kiditum da ta di ta di kiditum da. It's just something like that where I'm playing and reciting, and then. One day I just had the idea, what if I just keep a beat for myself, a simple beat, and then recite you know, and that, that took a while <laughs> to get that, that kind of coordination. So I'm not playing a very sophisticated drum part. It's just very basic, but it's just then reciting the conical over that. So that, that was like a new idea that I just s slowly but surely worked on the coordination to do that. I'm sure it wouldn't be that different from a s drummer that sings like Phil Collins or, or Don Henley or somebody that, you know, you have to have a certain coordination to be able to play a drum part and, and sing on top of it. Now, I don't sing at all, but, but I did work out the coordination to, to do the Indian conical over a groove. But you have a fifth limb if you want. Yeah, a fifth limb. But counting out loud has always been something that I've done from the first moment I picked up a drumstick. Like my drum teacher, Billy Flanagan, from when I was nine years old, like, you know, I'd be one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four, counting out loud and, pl and reading. Yeah, sure. and, and so that, be that was second nature for me. And you have to count when you're reading a chart, you know, and you want to keep your place and you're playing with a big band or whatever the situation is, you have to count and play. So that's not hard for me to do because it came at the beginning yes. and it was ingrained, always count out loud. And it, and it does work wonders to do that. It's helpful. Colliding with other musicians on a creative level, those battles uh, in, in a band can be stressful, but you can learn from it. I learned a lot from those crashes, yeah, or okay. whatever you might call it. Had you say, similar experiences where you're like, uh, oh, there was a fight and maybe I, I did something wrong. Maybe I should do this. And that was maybe one of the most important lessons you have ever learned. Yeah, I, I th for the most part, the people that I work with even when there are differences of opinions, everyone's mature enough to work it out without being dramatic. But, you know, we are a lot older, like whether it's the guys in Journey or whether it's the guys in Vital Information or, um, or Groove Blue, you know, we, we all have our uh, perspectives and opinions. So we occasionally can disagree about certain things. But I can say universally with all of those situations, everyone's willing to give the other person's idea a chance. Like nobody is just like, no, let's not do that. It's usually, and, and usually we try all the ideas. 
And for the most part, the best idea reveals itself. And you don't have to fight for it. In ge- you know, that's the best case. And that does seem to happen a lot. And it, it, it did happen a lot with Journey, even in the early years when we were young and, and headstrong and we're all in our 20s. But, but everyone was smart enough to know that the collaboration, the collective was stronger than the individual. So we, we try the ideas out. We record them, we listen to them. And I would say record them on a cassette tape in a rehearsal, not in a recording studio. And we, and we try different ideas and usually the conflict would resolve itself because the best idea would just become obvious. So that's, that's my most of my experience. So the, learn, the, the learning part is try out all the ideas. You know, try them all out. And, and hopefully the best idea will re- reveal itself. But if not, then <laughs> whoever's the leader at the time will, <laughs> yeah, right. will take, the, take the lead. Yeah, unfortunately, maybe that's it's the problem I have in metal music, and maybe I should do something else. <laughs> Is what? What's the problem? No, it's ego. Not on my side, because I want to get there. Yeah. And I get there eventually, so right. I, I swallow a lot to go there. Yeah. But there are egos involved, yeah. and some, right. up to a certain point, I'm like, dude, no. Yeah. But they don't want to swallow. They just want to be... It, the, 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 the leader of the pack. Yeah. And this is very frustrating for a yes. person like myself. Yeah. But as drummers, we usually have to be the more diplomatic <laughs> of the other musicians. It just, it just goes with the territory because we are accompanists, fundamentally accompanists. So I would say, yeah, more often than not, the drummer has to... <laughs> has to go with the flow. <laughs> But a lot of times I find the drummers have very good ideas because they are in this place of orchestration. You know, the, the, everything, especially in rock music and metal music, it, it gets orchestrated from the drum set. A lot of times the other part, instruments are playing something to do with how the drums are playing rhythmically. Isn't that a little control? What's that? Isn't that a little bit of control? Yes, yes I is. guess it is. Yeah, I'm still making progress. So I enjoy practicing. It's also just a very nice part of the, my day. It is, in a way, like a, I'd say a meditation, but it's like kind of a grounding thing. Like it's something I've done my whole life that feels like I have some time in my drum room and I work on just some new ideas or in general, I'm working on some music that I have to learn to play a gig. You know, whether it's I'm hired as a sideman or whether I'm a band leader or whether it's, you know, doing another journey tour or something. I'm usually learning some music and then trying to come up with new ways of approaching it or new vocabulary, new ways of orchestrating a, a melody or new soloing ideas in context. So it's... If you're familiar, there's a very good book by Jeffrey, um, well, now I can't remember, his, like, can't remember his last name, but it's called Talent is Overrated. That's the, the, and it's a very good book. And he gets into the details of, of deliberate practice. And, and I say that's what I do. I don't do any kind of general practice, like just sitting there and playing rudiments or stick control or something like that. Of course, I did that for many, many years. But now it's, I practice and I use all that vocabulary and, and new vocabulary, but based on what it is that I'm learning, the music that I'm learning, the, the music that I'll be playing. So the things that inspire me the most, <laughs> 
to keep practicing and working is a date on the calendar and a deadline. Because you've got to learn this music by this date, and then we're going to be on stage playing it. So that kind of stress, you know, that kind of, uh, there's a finite point. I've got to learn this music, and I've got to practice and, and get to that deadline. That keeps me pretty inspired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, this has been an interesting time here on Drum Talk, and hope you all enjoy this interview. And uh, I'll see you on tour, whether it's with Vital Information, Groove Blue, Journey, or whatever band that I'm playing with. Come out and hear some live music and feel what it feels like to experience music in a live venue because it can be life-changing. <laughs>